Hello again, everyone. <clears throat> we saw in chapter 27 electromagnetic radiation and the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum that light travels at an extraordinarily high speed in general, specifically in a vacuum where there's nothing to get in its way. Empty space, light travels at over 299 million meters per second. You know that we have typically rounded that off to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, 300 million meters per second. And we spoke in our last meeting about scattering and how light from the sun, because of the size of the molecules in our atmosphere, um, those oxygen and nitrogen molecules that make up 99% or so of our atmosphere, that those that light, at least the blue light, more so than the red, scatters. It interacts with those molecules. Those molecules absorb, grab that energy for an instant, millionths of a second, and then just emit that light in all directions. That's why we see blue light no matter where we look in the sky. On an uncloudy day, we see a blue sky everywhere. It's truly absorbing and re-emitting that light in a scattering process. Well, light interacts with things, whether it be the oxygen, nitrogen in our atmosphere, or the water as light enters water, or the plastic in my prescription glasses, the plastic that makes up these lenses. It turns out light interacts with materials, transparent materials, as well as opaque materials where it reflects, but let's stick with transparent materials. The light, as it goes into that material, water, glass, what have you, it interacts, and that, that interaction of the wave with the material and the electro electrons in that material causes the light to slow down. So it really only travels at this speed in a vacuum. Now, there's an equation, um, I believe it's in chapter 29 of your book, and we may not get all the way through that, but I wanna introduce this today and show you it, the phenomenon that it leads to up close. There's a formula for the speed of light in a material. The speed that light travels at in a particular substance depends on something we call the index of refraction. And many books put this formula up solved for the n term, but I think it's more intuitive to write it as I have written it. The speed of light in the substance, whether it's glass, plastic, water, what have you, is equal to the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by something called the index of refraction of that substance. Some common values for indices of refraction, the n of, n of air is really close to 1. So we typically just use one for air. But water, water has an index of refraction of 1 and 1.333. Some types of glass, there are more than one type of glass, flint glass, quartz. But flint glass has an index of refraction of 1.531. So what that means is if this is 1, and for a vacuum, n is 1, exactly 1, then C over 1 is C, and the speed of light is C in a vacuum. But in any substance whose index is greater than 1, light slows down. If you had a material whose index of refraction were 2, then the speed of light would be what? C over 2, or 1 half of the speed of light in a vacuum, about 1.5 times 10 to the 8. Part of why I brought this up today and what I want to show you in a demonstration in a moment is that this slowing down leads to bending. And this bending is not only interesting, but it's how gl people's prescription glasses and contact lenses work. So let's look at that real quick. 
Imagine light is traveling in air and it reaches an air-water interface. Turns out it bends when it enters the water. Now, some of the light may be reflected. We're going to ignore that for the moment. It's important that I bring up something that I, we've never talked about, and that is what's called the normal. We had force normal in the fall with the friction mu times the normal force, but the angles in this process are always measured relative to the imaginary perpendicular to the surface, what we call the normal. So I'm going to measure the angles that the bending is described by, referring to the angle relative to this dotted perpendicular to the water surface. Let's say light comes in at some angle relative to the normal, typically called, typically called theta i for the angle of incidence. If this material has a lower index of refraction, which air does compared to water, it is seen that the ray of light bends toward the normal. So that this angle, theta r, for the angle of refraction, fraction, this angle theta r is less than theta i. Again, the ray is entering water from air, and it bends toward the normal. I'm going to show this to you with a laser in a moment, but a quick point I think I'd like to make here. <coughs> This process is reversible as well. So if I actually shine the light in the water and it entered the air, you would see that it moves away from the normal because of course it is more, it, it is traveling in a greater index of refraction and, and tra transmitted into it material with a lower index of refraction. So if it goes from more to less, it's away from the normal. If it goes from less to, to more, it's toward the normal. Um, let's take a look at that in the lab. I have a laser, and it's a green laser, and if I turn it on, you can't see the beam very well because you don't see laser, you don't see light at all unless it's reflecting off of something. We've talked about that a lot when we talked about color. So my hand provides a surface molecules for the light to interact and reflect and you see it. But in air you don't see the light, in water you typically don't see the light unless there's dust or plankton or something in the water. You'll see I have a fish tank here and I have actually put some milk in the water so that there are particles for it to reflect off of and you can see the beam in the water now. If it was just clean water you wouldn't see much of anything. I've also put an incense stick in the tank, and so there's smoke present, and you can see the light scattering and reflecting off of the smoke particles. But what I wanted to show you, of course, is this idea of refraction. Again, Refraction is the bending of light when it goes from one medium to another. Now, if I go straight in, it doesn't bend much at all. In fact, it doesn't bend at all. It slows down, but it does not bend. But if I come in at an angle, now you can see, again, some of it is reflected off of the top surface, but a good amount of the light is transmitted into the water and I think you can see that it bends relative to the normal. And of course, if I go the other way, if I go from under the tank and out, you'll see it bends away from the normal. Again, there's a small part of it that is reflected off the water surface.
thought I would put a mirror in here, and I did, just so you, it's kind of interesting to watch what happens when it comes off the mirror on the bottom of the tank. There's now a plain mirror on the bottom of the tank. Right around 1600, so 421 years ago or so, a man named Willebrord Snellius, who had an unfortunate name, developed a mathematical model to explain the relationship between the indices of refraction and these angles, theta i, the angle of incidence or incoming angle, and theta r, the angle of refraction or the refracted angle. And it's given the name Snell's Law because his name is so painful to even pronounce. Snell's Law states that Ni sine theta i equals Nr sine theta r. So that if you know the two indexes of refraction, indices of refraction, we might say, and you know one of the angles, you can solve for the other. On Monday, Tuesday of next week, I will show you an interesting phenomenon that comes directly from the fact that this relationship is true.